Hi, welcome to our channel of IGNU Audiobooks, Indira Gandhi National Open University, School of Management Studies, SOMS. Master of Business Administration, Marketing Management, MBAM. MMPC 001 Management Functions and Organizational Processes. Block 1 Introduction to Management. Unit 2 Management and Its Evolution. Evolution 2.1 Introduction. The evolution of management roots back to the contribution of various schools of management thought, which emphasize certain philosophies and approaches as best for managing the organizations. They are referred to as approaches of theories and provide various perspectives on management, 2.2 perspectives of management. The empirical or classical perspective, the empirical or classical approach to management was proposed in the early part of the 20th century. To some extent, it is accepted and practiced by many managers even today. The exponents of this school of management emphasize the importance of the study of the experiences of successful managers. They claimed that such a study would provide a better understanding of the most effective way of managing an enterprise. At times, they stressed the need for the study and the analysis of cases. However critics view that management is not like law to be based on precedent. Management is dynamic and the situation in which managers take decisions vary considerably to the previous experiences. Three separate branches of the classical approach are evident, scientific, management, administrative theory and bureaucracy, a. Scientific management this perspective grew out of a need to improve manufacturing efficiency through more effective utilization of physical and human resources. This was proposed by F. W. Taylor, who is considered as the father of scientific management. He observes that the best management is true science resting upon clearly defined laws, roles, and principles as a foundation. He spent a greater part of his life finding solutions to the problem of achieving greater efficiency on the shop floor. Taylor observed that the workers got used to intentionally delay the process of completing the job and complain about the tools and equipment provided to them of a low standard and obsolete. He identified the need to teach the workers that they would not be thrown out of employment if they turn out more work. The solution suggested by Taylor was the outcome of his own experience at work, initially at the shop floor and later as a manager. He proposed this at the backdrop of the Industrial Revolution. Employers gave a high degree of priority to efficient working methods. Taylor was passionately interested in the efficiency of working methods. He initially realized that the systematic analysis of work would find a solution to all the problems associated with enhancing the efficiency of the working methods. He also realized that this was the only way to address the apprehensions of workers. Taylor thus consolidated his ideas at the Bethlehem Steel Company and conducted some of the most famous experiments to improve labor productivity. He has published his work in an article called The Principles of Scientific Management in 1911. He was the first person to recognize and emphasize the need for adopting a scientific approach to the task of an enterprise. Elements of scientific management Scientific management referred to the process of applying scientific principles to management-related issues. Scientific management methods call for optimizing the way that Tasks were preformed and the job simplified so that the workers could be trained to perform specialized sequence of motions in the one best way. After years of various experiments to determine optimal work methods, Taylor proposed the following four principles of management. I. Develop a science for each element of an individual's work. This would mean replacing the role of thumb work methods with methods based on a scientific study of the task. Prior to this workers, used approximation, which was derived from their experience, to scientifically select, train, teach and develop each worker rather than passively leaving them to train themselves. Prior to this, workers, chose their own work and trained themselves as they could. 3. Heartily cooperate with the workers so as to ensure that work is done in accordance with the principles of science that had been developed. Prior to this management and workers were in continual, conflict, 4. Divide work and responsibility almost equally between management and workers. Management would take over all the work for which it is better suited than the workers, which means that the managers would apply the scientific management principles to planning the work and the workers actually performed the task. Prior to this, almost all the work and the greater part of responsibility were left to 
the workers. These principles were implemented in many factories and the productivity increased three to four times. Henry Ford applied Taylor's principles in his automobile factories and even families began to use these principles in their household task, Taylor's experiments. Taylor demonstrated the benefits of increased productivity and earnings through an experiment in Bethlehem Steel Works. Prior to scientific management, work was performed by skilled craftsmen who had learnt their work in a lengthy apprenticeship. They took their own decisions on the way the jobs have to be performed. Scientific management took away much of their autonomy and converted skilled crafts into a series of simplified jobs that could be performed by unskilled workers who could easily be trained for the task. His interest in improving the worker productivity could be seen early in his career, where he observed gross efficiencies during his contact with the steel workers, soldering. His work in the steel industry made him observe the phenomenon of workers, purposely operating well below their capacity i.e. soldering. He attributed this to the following reasons, 1. The almost universally held belief among workers that if they become more productive, fewer of them would be needed, thus eliminating some of the jobs, 2. Non-incentive wage systems encouraged lower productivity, 3. There were no incentives that were paid as part of the wage and hence all, the employees received the same pay irrespective of the volume of work produced by them. They believed that the pace with which they did was good enough and with no incentive if the pace of work is done faster, that would lead to newer benchmarks. Thus, they were working much below their capacity. 4. Workers relied more on the rule of thumb method, thus wasting a lot of their effort and not following the scientific methods to carry out their tasks. Thus Taylor conducted several experiments to determine the best way of performance in each of the tasks. Some of the experiments are 1. Time study, to determine the optimal method to perform a job, Taylor conducted the time and motion studies. He used a stopwatch to record the time taken by a worker in the sequence of his movements in the job. His goal was to find out one best way to perform a job. He argued that the most basic task, if planned and done scientifically could dramatically increase the productivity rather than the incentive method of motivating workers. The basic premise of the initiative and incentive method was to offer an incentive to the worker for increased productivity but such a method also plays the responsibility of doing it in the best possible way. Some examples of his experiments in time and motion studies are a pig iron experiment. Taylor argued that if the workers were asked to move 12 and a half tons of pig iron per day and could be induced to move four times of the same per day, they would get exhausted and fail to reach the goal. According to him if the works manager could conduct an experiment and arrive at a standard time for their rest, work etc., their physical abilities could be used to the optimum. The workers could also be segregated based on their ability and levels of performance to do the job. B. The science of shoveling, in another study, Taylor used the time studies again to determine that the optimal weight that a worker should lift in a shovel was 21 pounds. He found out that the density of materials are different and, hence the size of the shovel should also be appropriate. Based on these, experiments, he found out that workers could be optimally used on the shop floor using scientific methods. He gave improvised implements, and could record a three- or four-fold increase in productivity and workers, were rewarded with increased pay and incentives, see, bricklaying, taking clue from Taylor, the Gilbreth's bricklaying experiments also proved a significant increase in the number of motions required to lay the bricks. They used the motion picture technology to do these experiments, contribution of scientific management, 1. Taylor was interested in replacing traditional management with scientific management by developing scientific principles through his experiments on people, machines, money and material to see that both the employer and the workers benefited. He argued for optimum use of resources both, human and material so that the firm can eliminate waste. With his time and motion studies, he has eliminated unnecessary movements, discovered the best method of doing a particular job and develop standards through the analytical approach, practices that he followed. He demonstrated how an average, passive worker could perform better if he's given proper instructions and implements to work. The result of all these experiments was latest specialization of activities, proper design of the job, appropriate methods and arriving at an optimum level in terms of time and motion standards, too. His contribution in terms of compensation reflected his foresight in 
improving productivity and reflect the thinking of the current times. His experiments aim at the scientific measurement of the job based on which the wage rates were to be determined. He argued that increased productivity should be compensated and not arbitrarily based on the union demands or management whims and fancies. He suggested the management to focus on creating a surplus and distributing it rather than dividing whatever is produced. 3. He called for a mental revolution both on the part of the workers and management. Mutual trust and cooperation should be built, according to him, to fully enjoy the benefits of scientific management. Such an approach, he argued would replace exploitation and advocated one best way to do everything. 4. Scientific management had a lot to contribute to the workers and their beliefs. Through his experiments he advised the workers to work using scientific principles and methods, stop worrying about how the surplus would be distributed and cooperate with the management to develop scientific ways, methods discarding the rule of thumb approach. He also called upon them to follow instructions of the management to chalk out the future course of action and get trained in the newer methods of work, with conviction. 5. Its contribution has benefited the industry at large with a rational approach, improved working methods, evolution of incentive system and enormous increase in the productivity of workers. The experiments laid the foundation for management techniques like the work study and other techniques. Criticism of scientific management Scientific management focused on the stakeholders in the process of industrial management. Hence, it was criticized by the employers, workers, and leaders, a, by insisting on one best way of doing a work. Scientific management ignored the creativity and innovation of the workers while on job, b. In the name of increasing the productivity and improvement in the standard of work, the workers were reduced to a cog in the machine. c. Analysis of the task in the job led to work getting fragmented with narrow specialization. The result was on the mechanical way of Conducting a particular task, d. The management emphasized on the design and planning of the job, ignored the worker and his experience, thus making it repetitive and boring. e. The overemphasized practice of the rule of thumb methods made the workers feel insecure in the name of scientific standards given by the management, b. Administrative theory. The French industrialist, Henry Fayol was a major contributor to the administrative theory. The other contributors are Mary Parker Follett, Lyndall Erwick Terry, Peter Drucker, Harold Kuntz etc. Known as the functional or process approach, the administrative theory describes the efforts to define the universal functions that managers perform and the principles that constitute good management practice. They emphasized management functions and attempted to generate broad administrative principles that serve as a framework. Guidelines for the rationalization of organizational activities including organizational structures and relationship. They viewed the job as an antecedent to the worker. Fayol argues that the organization's function from the management point of view. He proposed that all managers perform five management functions of planning, organizing, commanding, coordinating and controlling. He also described the practice of management as distinct from accounting, finance, production distribution, and other business functions. His contribution also lies in his observation that management was an activity common to all human undertakings in business, government, in a charity, organization, and even at home. He also proposed 14 principles of administration which he believed would be applied most often in organizational functioning. They are, I, division of work, fail advocated division of work, which means that a worker is given only some elements of work to take advantage of specialization. Since the worker repeats the same task, the manager corrects him on the task, they acquire an ability and accuracy, thus increasing their output and efficiency. Division of work thus can be applied to all types of work e-technical, managerial, and at all levels of management. 2. Authority and responsibility e-authority provides the right to command to get the work done. It is derived from the position and personal authority is derived from personal factors like intelligence, experience, ethics etc. of the individual. Responsibility is the accountability of the authority and arises out of the assignment of activity. 3. Discipline e According to Fayol, discipline is obedience energy, mark of respect, as shown by the behavior of employees in accordance with the employment contracts and rules. Discipline presupposes self-imposed discipline, which springs from within the 
Individual as an active spontaneous response to an experienced. Leader. Command discipline on the other hand, is derived from a, recognized authority to secure compliance and is bound by rules, regulation, culture etc. 4. Unity of command e it means that an employee should receive, orders from one superior only. If the employee receives multiple, commands, he gets confused and cannot carry out any of the orders. In such situations authority gets undermined, discipline is in danger. Orders get disobeyed and stability of the organization gets, threatened, v unity of direction. This principle is concerned with the functioning, of the organization in respect of its grouping of activities. Activities, with the same objective in an organization are grouped together and they must have one head and one plan, which ensures better, coordination among the activities. 6. Subordination of individual interest to general interest individuals. As members of the organization are bound by the organizational interest and in case of conflict between the two, individual interest should not prevail over that of the organization. 7. Remuneration of personnel, the methods of payment and remuneration should be fair and should give satisfaction to both employer and the employee. Various systems of payment of wages are not considered of universal application and none of them can be a perfect method, according to Fayol. He also stressed the non-financial incentive system, which was not accepted as a matter of significance by the management. 8. Centralization e Fayol refers to this principle as the extent to which authority is concentrated or dispersed. A delicate balance of centralization of power and distribution of power should be used by the organization. The objective should be to utilize the talent ability available in the organization so that authority and responsibility are retained by the management. 9. Scalar chain, the line of authority from the top management to the lowest ranks represents the scalar chain. Communication flows through this chain only. It can be skipped only when it is detrimental to the organization. Fayol suggested gangplank for cross. Communication to prevent the scalar chain from preventing action. X, order, E order refers to the arrangement of things and people, meaning that there is a place for everything and everything should be in place. In social order there should be the right man in the right place. 11. Equity, equity is a combination of justice and kindness. If an organization demonstrates equity in treatment and behavior, the company is admired, liked by everyone and ensures loyalty and devotion from subordinates. Equity also assures cordial relations between the management and the workers, thus leading to organizational health. 12. Stability of tenure. Stability of tenure is reasonable security of jobs. Turnover is both the cause and effect of inefficient management. Fayol considers that it is much better to have an average or mediocre manager than extraordinary managers who move rapidly in and out of the function. 13. Initiative e initiative within the limits of authority and discipline increases the zeal and energy of the human element. Fayol describes initiative as one of the satisfaction for an intelligent man to experience. Management should encourage their employees to take initiative to turn out the best work with the maximum versatility. Initiative should also be encouraged so that it can be integrated into the planning process in the organization. 14. Esprit de corps e esprit de corps denotes team spirit and union is strength. It encourages the spirit and devotion that is required to ensure group harmony. Fayol underscores the need for harmonious relation among the people as it is the best source of strength, strength, stability, stature, and reputation depend on the harmonious relations among the employees. C. Bureaucracy, while Taylor focused on the management of workers on the shop floor, Fayol's focus was on the general management functions in the organization. Closely related to these ideas Max Weber, the German sociologist focused on developing a theory of bureaucratic management that emphasized a theory of authority, structure and describing organizational activity as based on authority and relations. He looked at management and organizational behavior from a structural perspective. Weber described an ideal type of organization that he called it a bureaucracy. It is characterized by division of labor, a clearly defined hierarchy, detailed rules and regulations and impersonal relationships. He recognized that this ideal bureaucracy does not exist in reality but, rather represented a selective reconstruction of the real world. He meant it to be taken as a basis for the rising about work and how work could be done in large groups. 
The features of Weber ideal bureaucracy are, I, job specialization, work is divided into simple, routine, and well, defined specialized tasks, two. Hierarchy I positions and people are organized with a clear, authority structure in a hierarchy with control and supervision of the higher authority. 3. Formal selection, employment and promotion must be merit-based, employee selection must be done on the basis of technical qualification demonstrated by training, education or a formal examination. 4. Formal rules and regulations A rigorous set of formal rules and regulations must be followed to ensure uniformity and regulate the actions of employees, v. impersonality. Superiors must conduct official duty with an impersonal attitude, apply rules and controls uniformly and avoiding involvement with the personal preferences. 6. Career orientation, e. managers are professionals and they work for a fixed remuneration and pursue their careers within the organization. The classical approach thus provides a basis for training managers by identifying the functions and skills of managers. Its focus is on the universality of management principles. It provides a mechanistic framework that overlooks the human factor in the organization and is based on the concept of rational economic man. In addition, other thinkers who contributed to the classical management are Mary Parker Follett and Chester Owen Bernard. Mary Parker Follett argued that managers and workers should be considered as a group. Follett also proposed the law of situation, which makes a person accept the situation in which an individual is placed and try to work within those boundaries. She also reiterated the concept of coordination as critical in the early stages of the organization to have a stronghold on the control process. On the other hand Bernard, who published the functions of the executive, focused on the integration of the individual and the organizational goals. He redefined the organization to include three elements a corporation, purpose, and communication. According to him, people have to willingly cooperate and work for a purpose using both the formal and informal channels in the organization. In his book, he proposed three functions of an executive. According to him, the executives must contribute and provide a system of communication so as to ensure performance according to their potential and contribute to the formulation of the purpose of the organization. Overall, the classical management theory proposed a framework and principles of management, which not only provided the guidelines to an organization to function but also served as the foundation for the modern management approaches. Human relations approach or the behavioral approach, the evolution of management thought is considered a logical extension of the ideas and experiments that were carried out across organizations and the experience of management thinkers are consultants in management. The human relations approach was considered a radical approach considering their times because of their focus on the psychological and sociological processes that influence employee performance. The human relations school stressed on the utility of human relations practices like leadership, communication and motivation. According to them, the focus of management must be centered on interpersonal relations and managing involves getting things done through people. For the first time the people aspect of management was highlighted, with a heavy orientation to psychology and social psychology with stress on, satisfying psychological needs and understanding the behavior of people. Classical theories have assumed man as an economic being driven by the fear of hunger and that management and workers do not demonstrate any conflict between them. Thus work, structures and rewards were used as focal points to suggest various principles and practices based on the number of experiments to improve productivity and effectiveness. For various reasons, the expected efficiency and productivity could not be achieved as expected, however, the application of scientific principles, motivating the workers, through rewards, stability of tenure, encouraging initiative and group, harmony as advocated by the classical approach have laid solid foundations for recognizing the people element in organization. I. Hawthorne studies, the most important contribution to the human relations movement was, beyond doubt, the first inquiry and the Hawthorne studies undertaken at, the Western Electrical Company at Hawthorne in Cicero, close to, Chicago, in the Illinois state. Originated in 1924 initially, and eventually, expanded to the 1930s by a set of consultants from Harvard, George, Elton Mayo and his associates were invited to join the team of industrial engineers to examine the effect of illumination levels on workers, productivity. This relationship, which began in 1927, lasted through 1932 and encompassed numerous experiments covering the redesign of jobs, changes in the length of the day and work week. 
rest periods, lunch, along with individual and group wage plans. Control and experimental, groups were established and the groups were presented with varying illumination intensities to conduct illumination experiments. Interviews were done to determine attitudes and analysis of the social organization among workers. They found out that the changes in the work environment had little effect on work productivity. When the illumination intensity was not directly related to group productivity, the engineers could not explain the behavior they witnessed. To their surprise, the results were confusing. Thus social norms or standards determined by the group were concluded to be the key determinants of individual work behavior. The results emphasized the recognition of the human factor. He along with his associates Kurt Lewin, Rothlisberger, Dixon, Lipper, and White, Koch and French believed that both psychological and physical aspects influence the capacity to work. The findings of the Hawthorne studies have been labeled as Hawthorne effect. It is a phenomenon which denotes that employees work harder and perform better if they believe that the management was concerned about their welfare and the superiors pay a special attention to them. Elton Mayo was thus considered the father of human relations approach. Assumptions The theory was based on the following assumptions i. The usefulness and the importance of people, 2. Recognition as individuals and their belongingness to the group, 3. The importance of esteem needs than money to motivate people to work for. Inform, listen to and make people feel that they can contribute to the organization, v. Exercise of self-control by individuals in routine matters, 6. Encouraging the participation of people and sharing information with them, 7. No resistance to change by the subordinates if the basic needs are met, findings, the Hawthorne studies have contributed significantly to the human relations, theory. Some of the findings are, i, social norms determine the level of production, not the psychological. Abilities of workers, 2. The behavior of workers is significantly affected by non-economic, rewards or sanctions, 3. Money is not the motivator of people, 4. Individuals act and react often as members of group, v. The importance of leadership in setting and enforcing group norms, 6. The working conditions do not influence productivity, rather complex, attitudes determines productivity, 7. Group pressure and not managerial demands exert a stronger influence, on productivity, 8. Rational economic man to be replaced by the concept of social man, 9. The behavior of a person and his sentiments are closely related, x. People can exercise self-control, the focal point in the human relations approach is the worker and not the job as in the classical approach. The human relations theory has contributed to new concepts in the understanding of an organization and made critical contribution to the understanding of people at work, people in groups and people in organizations. The systems approach, this approach is an extension of the human relations approach and views, management as a social system. Influenced by the sociologists, it aims at, identifying various social groups with the fundamental belief in the need to, solve the biological, physical and social limitations through cooperation. The, systems approach has proposed a new way of thinking about the organization, and the managers. The theory proposes that a system has a number of sub, Systems which are interdependent and each of which contributes to the unique characteristics of the whole system to achieve a set purpose. For example, a number of components like monitor, keyboard, mouse, CPU in a computer together help us in entering the data information to make it a readable article. With the advancement of technology, however some of the accessories like keyboard, mouse etc. got inbuilt into the system. For example tablet, cell phone etc. where, some of the subsystem got in built with, an addition of other subsystems. Thus computers, tablets, cell phones etc. are, all equipment which are made up of many parts which are interconnected and, interrelated. The absence of one might affect the performance of the entire, equipment. Similarly, organization is a social system composed of people, groups, and their relationships. The contribution of the social systems approach thus stresses on the need for understanding the individual, the group, the relationships and the influence of the informal organization on the formal organization decision theory approach. This approach was proposed after the Second World War. Since managerial function revolves round right decision making, this approach adopts this as its central focus and studied the process of decision making, which includes 
selecting the right course of action from possible alternatives. It involves the application of sophisticated techniques for solving managerial problems, especially planning and control. Mathematical a quantitative approach, the mathematical approach provides a quantitative basis for decision, making, considering management as a system of mathematical models and processes. According to this approach, decision-making is a logical process and can be expressed in terms of mathematical symbols, formulas or models. The contribution of this approach relates to a number of sophisticated tools and techniques like simulation, linear programming, gaming etc. which assist managerial decision-making and makes it simple even in large organization. Currently, organizations are using big data and data analytics to handle large volumes of data. Such tools and techniques help in the data analytics that are being used by the organizations for decision-making. Contingency approach, this approach emerges from the real-life experiences of managers who found out that no single approach model worked consistently in every situation. This approach believes that managerial practices and styles differ in different situations or contexts. Closely dependent on the ground realities of the managerial function, it is believed to be a practical and the realistic approach to carry out the tasks of management. This approach is based on the logic that organizations differ in size, scale, scope, purpose and so on, the values, the perception, the attitudes, needs and the experiences of individuals and hence, they argue that there can be no one best way to manage people in organizations and no single set of principles can be applied universally. Although this approach appears to be a pragmatic approach, it can become operational only when the actions to be taken in alternative situations are prescribed. In addition, determining and including all the relevant contingency factors demonstrating their relations can be a complex process, Theory X and Theory Y, Douglas McGregor. An American social psychologist proposed the theory X and theory Y in his book, The Human Side of Enterprise in 1960. The theory is a simple reminder of the natural rules for managing people, which are forgotten by managers easily in their pressure of day-to-day functioning. McGregor observed the way managers deal with their employees and concluded that a manager's view of the nature of human beings is based on a certain grouping of assumptions and that the employers mold their behavior towards employees according to these assumptions. He classifies these assumptions as theory X which reflects authoritarian management style and theory Y the participative management style. Assumptions of theory X the assumptions of managers under theory X are the average person dislikes work and so he tries to avoid it. Since they dislike work they must be forced to work using the carrot and stick theory. The average person is self-centered and indifferent to organizational goals. The average person prefers to be directed as he lacks ambition. The average person looks for security and hence resists change. Thus, managers decide, retain their authority, and inform the workers about the work task to be done. Assumptions of Theory Y The assumptions held by the manager under Theory Y are people love work and hence they work like play. Since they love work, they seek and look for additional responsibilities. Since they enjoy working, they apply self control and self direction. Commitment to objectives is a function of rewards associated with their achievement. Thus, these two theories assume a particular behavior from the employees. William Auchi, a consultant, Japanese by birth and American by training, in his book Theory Z highlighted how American management can beat the Japanese challenge in 1981. As a board member of several organizations in the USA, he advocated a hybrid management style which is a combination of American management style and the Japanese management style. He argued that management must have a high degree of confidence in the workers for the participative management style that he suggested, as can be seen, a number of psychologists, sociologists, public, administrators, and business managers have contributed to the evolution of management thought. More recently, Peter Drucker has contributed to the building of a number of management concepts, while thinkers like Edwards Deming, Joseph Duran have contributed towards the quality concerns in management. The perspective of Thomas Peters and Robert Waterman highlighted the characteristics of excellent companies in their book E in Search of Excellence. Further, more recent notable contribution from the contemporary management perspectives include the strategic management approach of C.K. Prahlad and Hamill, the radical change concept of Sumantra Goshal, the learning organization concept of Peter Senge, the change management and the role of managers as change masters of Rosbeth, Moskanta.
all these perspectives turned management into a more dynamic field to be regarded as the management theory jungle. 2.3 Summary The evolution of management thought evidences the contribution of multiple perspectives from the classical approach, which provided the foundations of management. The neo classical school comprising of the perspectives of the sociologists, psychologists, and business managers have contributed to the knowledge and the practice of management. The transformation process continued with the contribution to the theory and practice of management by the contemporary management thinkers and consultants across the world. Thus making management an exciting field of study and inquiry for both the researchers and the managers. Thank you, subscribe to our channel for more updates, and we will see you with the next chapter.